Do we want to get started? Do you want me to start presenting? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, to just a uh, quick um, um, housekeeping stuff. Uh, today, we have another Snarknet House session. Um, obviously, we have a physical session in parallel with um, Marcelo connecting in. Uh, Lara Finance, right? Uh, Mike is hosting the physical session. So um, today, we'll be talking about financial derivatives, derivatives and uh, the uh, uh, underlying tools that will help you build uh, powerful derivatives today on StarkNet. Uh, let's get it started. And I think a, a good order would be to have the Lira Finance team talk about the, the application first, followed by uh, Marcelo talking about the tools that will help you build the application. So yeah. Welcome everyone. And let's get the presentation started. Yeah, cool. Thanks for that intro. Uh, happy to kick it off. I will just share my screen. One sec. Can you guys see that? Really? Yep. Great. All good. Um, cool. All right. Hey, everyone. So my name is Mike. I'm from Lyra Finance. We're an options protocol. Um, currently on Optimism, um, but looking at you know other platforms as well, such as Starknet. So I wanted to give a talk today and, and talk you through kind of what we've been thinking about and the experiments we've been running. Um, maybe before that, just quickly to, to provide a little bit of context, like what Lyra is, like, as I said, an options protocol on optimism, basically we have this automated market maker that allows people to deposit funds into a liquidity pool, kind of like you do on Uniswap. And those funds get used to make two-way options markets on a range of different assets, right? So um, we've recently just released our biggest version of the upgrade of the protocol to date. So it's called Avalon. And I've just grabbed a screenshot here from, from the Avalon DAP. We've just got some more people coming in. So maybe we should give them a sec. Hello. Here they come. Hey guys. Hello. 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 Oh, we've got, got a few people coming in now. We thought it was just going to be us two. Nice enough of Lara Green. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Sorry. I'm moving. Nice to you guys. We just had about five or six people come in. So <laughs> feeling a lot much more uh, active in here now. Take a seat. No worries. Um, yeah, so as, as I was saying, we're an options trading protocol live on Optimism at the moment. We are using an AMM model. Um, this is a screenshot from our recent version of the protocol called Avalon, um, which introduced a number of improvements like capital efficiency for option selling, rolling expiries for traders, and just any time entry exit from the liquidity pool as well. Um, so that's kind of what we do. And if you want to head to the DAP and try it out, feel free. We'd love to kind of get feedback on it. Um, but today, of course, I want to talk about StockNet, derivatives on StockNet, um, and kind of set the groundwork, I guess, for like the experiments we're going to be running. So to start off, I wanted to give a little bit of background as to like how I think about Cairo and StockNet and kind of what this is giving to the industry. Then I want to talk about why you build derivatives at all on StockNet. Um, Finally, I just want to touch briefly on how I think we should build them and then kind of roll into a couple of experiments we've been running that just, yeah, really kind of like show what we've been doing. Um, so I'll get started now with the background. Uh, if we think if we go all the way back to the start of crypto in 2008 with, with Bitcoin, um, we got this kind of trusted state machine, right? We got this ability to transact trustlessly in a third you know, peer to peer fashion. Um, but it was quite limited. It was application specific, right? You could send Bitcoin around. You couldn't do much else. Maybe you could build some stuff with script on top of it, colored coins, things like that, but you couldn't really generalize that paradigm, right? So people pretty quickly started to ask like, well, you know, Bitcoin's great. The underlying blockchain technology is great, but what could we do with a more generalized environment? You know, maybe we could build financial applications, NFTs, all the things we kind of know and love today. And in 2015, about seven years later, Ethereum came to the table and said, basically, we're going to take the underlying technology from Bitcoin, the blockchain, proof of work, consensus, all that stuff, and provide a Turing complete programming environment, um, the EVM, Solidity, that kind of stuff. And now the onus is now shifted onto the developers. They can build whatever they want, right? Smart contracts. And then that's how you start to see DeFi, NFTs. Um, in theory, you can build anything you want, right? However, in practice, what you can actually build on chain is pretty limited at this point, because one of the ways that these systems like Bitcoin and Ethereum provide a trustless platform and become decentralized is that 
basically full nodes on the network validated every transaction that happens and the way the state updates, right? And the problem with that is it's great because permissionless, but the problem is it really constrains what you can do in a decentralized way, right? Because you're only as strong as your weakest link. If you make the blockchain go too fast or grow too quickly, people drop off, it becomes more centralized. You kind of get stuck in this thing known as the blockchain trilemma where you're kind of trading off scalability, security and, and decentralization. So this is okay, right? Like we still see DeFi flourish in the last few years. We see NFTs come of age, but you know, we're really limited in what we can do beyond that, right? And this is where like Stark comes into the equation, right? In 2018, this paper comes out um, and this idea of scalable verification, right? So separating the actual computation that gets run on the chain from the verification of, of that computation. So maybe it's not all, you know, ON on both sides, right? And the idea here is basically that you have a prover um, who basically takes a bunch of computation or a bunch of transactions and basically produces a cryptographic proof that these transactions were valid, right? And the way it's designed is obviously quite complicated. There's a lot of maths. The papers, you know, I would recommend it if you're mathematical. Um, but the key takeaway here is that the verification now becomes logarithmic with respect to the actual computation and the generation of the proof, right? So for the first time, we've kind of decoupled the actual computation from the ver verification itself. And we now have the ability to do things much faster, at much higher performance than we've ever had before, right? But we have a similar problem to Bitcoin 2008, where like, it's very application specific. So Stark is great and systems start getting built with Starkware, StarkX, so immutable, you know, builds an NFT order book, minting, exchanging, DYDX builds a high performance perps exchange, but it's application specific. And if you can't build all those pieces yourself or work directly with Starkware, then you, you can't really do anything yet, right? And there are developers like us who wanna build other stuff. And flash forward to 2022 with Cairo, what we've now got is this kind of generalized programmable environment where we can write the kinds of programs we wanna write. And I think this is the start of a new paradigm shift. And I think it's started like realizing the original vision that was introduced with Bitcoin in 2008, which was the ability to do trustless computation in a decentralized way. So the way I like to think about it is like Cairo is to stock what Ethereum was to Bitcoin, right? And basically what's happening here is it's in, so in Bitcoin's case, we had this application specific sort of trusted compute environment and Ethereum generalized it and meant we can program whatever we want. And in Stark, we had this idea of scalable verification. Now with Cairo, we have the ability to program whatever we want in that way, right? So I think both these concepts, they're kind of taking an application specific innovation and generalizing, making it accessible to developers who can program, which I think is, is great for innovation and accessibility. Um, so one step forward now, if we agree that that's interesting, then why would we why would we build on Stark and what would we build, right? So there's two avenues here, I think. The first one's quite powerful, maybe not as exciting and innovating, but still very interesting, which is like we can take what we've done on L1 to date, all the DeFi, all the NFTs, everything, and we can make it cheaper, we can make it faster, potentially we can make it private as well. So I know that it's not the focus of Starkware and Starknet right now, but the ability to withhold some of the information that might be sensitive from you know, a ZK Stark or something like this is I think something that will unlock a huge new wave of adoption and innovation. And not to discredit the first two points either, cheaper and faster is a pretty big deal as well for people who are priced out of Ethereum L1 right now, um, but people who just, their applications don't work with kind of long block times and things like that. So there's that side of things. And then there's the increased scope of what can actually be done on chain, right? So maybe we're no longer limited anymore to the idea of, you know, DeFi and simple NFTs and things like that. Like maybe we can get truly on-chain games, right? So I know that's what Topology is working on uh, and a bunch of the other StarkNet projects are actually focusing on gaming at the moment, right? And this idea that instead of just having the first gen Web3 games, right? You have basically the whole game runs off-chain and you tokenize the items and then they trade on a blockchain, maybe a roll-up or an L1, right? And with StarkNet gaming, it's like, what if we move the logic and the application state on-chain and kind of let the players collectively kind of discover the boundaries there and innovate and build new things and kind of redefine what the game is as it evolves on chain. That to me is really interesting. Secondly, the other one that pops out to me is this idea of being able to do things like inference, right, on chain, which we just never thought of before as being possible. And I know Giza is a protocol working on Starknet who are looking to bring inference onto the blockchain. And maybe we can start to actually make these smart contracts, you know, somewhat smarter than they are right now. They're not relative, they're not really incorporating any learning at the moment. Finally, as well, another one which we've talked about for a while is like media, right? Like we know this is one of the biggest problems today is the centralization of social media, these platforms we spend all our lives on on a day-to-day -day basis. 
can we start to now finally rebuild that sort of scale of infrastructure on a decentralized environment? And I think that's the opportunity we have here basically. So that's the two directions I think we can take. If that's what's going to happen and people are going to bring L1 apps to, to Sark there and people are going to also bring, you know, new kinds of things, how do derivatives come into this piece, right? So as things come on chain, I posit that everyone becomes a token holder, right? So if you think about gaming, you think about in-game items, I think of them as tokens, right? You think about, say, machine learning, I think of algorithms, data, I think of tokens. Same for social media, right? Posts, videos, photos, I think these are all tokens. And I think the initial reaction a lot of people have is like, well, this is excessive. Why would you tokenize everything, right? It's like, it's nothing, not everything needs to be a token. And I think what happens though is the subtler point here is that like tokenization and ownership is the thing that really makes crypto separate from like these earlier concepts of the internet, right? So when you tokenize something and you give the person the ability to actually own it, you allow that person to access its value, right? Via a market. If it's an ERC20 fungible token, you can take it to a DEX, you can take it to Uniswap, trade it. If it's an NFT, you can take it to marketplaces or whatever and list it, right? And you give that ability to the owner where it might not have existed before. So I think that's actually a very profound thing and probably the core of what crypto enables. Um, so imagine we have all these token holders in the future from all this new stuff we're doing on chain, but markets are super volatile, right? We know this, like as recently, you know, we've probably all experienced, right? Crypto markets are more volatile than any, any other market. Um, so if we have this new groups of token holders, right? And they're, we've financialized what they're holding, they have the ability to enter these markets, but they're now exposed to huge price, price fluctuations, right? Increases, decreases, volatility. And a lot of them aren't speculators, right? They're not here to trade coins and get rich. They're here to live their life, maybe on chain, do something, run some business, some activity. And like, how do these people actually protect themselves, right? And I think an interesting story here to think about is we talk about it, Lyra a bit is like this parable of like the wheat farmer, right? So we've seen this problem before, right? If we go all the way back to the start of derivatives industries, we had farmers who were producing commodities, crops, things like that. And they, for example, maybe they had to sell a crop in a month's time when the harvest was due, right? And they had a bunch of fixed costs. Maybe they had employees, they had things like this. That they knew they had to pay for. They didn't know if they were going to be selling their crop for, you know, $100, $90, $50. The market can do what it's wanted in that time, right? So basically what a derivative does is it gives this person the ability to lock in a price now in the future so that they can have certainty about what's going to play out in the future. And that's actually really important because it enables non-speculators to enter markets and to operate in those markets without being subject to the whims of price fluctuations. But I think that's really, really pivotal and critical to this like on-chain sort of world that we're building. Okay, so why options specifically? So at Lyra, we focus on options. Um, options are a type of derivative, right? And it's actually quite a simple idea, although there's a lot of kind of ways it can be you know expanded so it's just the right to buy or sell an asset so buying an asset's called a call option selling an asset's called a put option um, for a certain strike price so that's like the price you agree to trade at on a certain date in the future uh, that's the expiry date so an example would be the eth 1000 put uh, expiring at the end of this month that's going to give the holder the right but not the obligation to sell eth for a thousand dollars on july 31 so say if you thought the bear market was going to continue to you know persist and ETH is going to go down even further, maybe you need to take that insurance out and have yourself, you know, some protection if that keeps happening, you'll be able to trade that ETH for $1,000. Um, so what I, what I think about from a systems perspective, if we kind of take the financial aspect, you know, out of it somewhat is like options are just a generic template for creating any payoff in the future. So if you want to pay off on a certain date, you can use a combination of options to get that payoff and you have to pay for that, obviously, you're paying for certainty over the future now, basically, is the concept we're talking about. So for those people who prefer graphs and are more visual, like this is like you can create any, like these are payoff graphs for options, right? You've got long call in the top left, long put, you know, but you've got all these combinations and you can actually start to really create whatever outcome you want if you're willing to, to pay for it. So they're incredibly fundamental, incredibly composable tools to, to finance. And I think incredibly important in this next wave of, um, you know, crypto development that stuff is bringing. Um, okay, so how should we build them? Um, now, this is, there's a few things I think we need to strive for, right? So the number one, which we all probably agree on is composability is one of the superpowers of crypto being on chain in this open source environment. So to me, that says build libraries, right? Build pieces of modular code that can be used by your protocol, but they can also be used by other protocols, right? So the first experiment we ran, which I'll run you guys through in a second, 
is a library we built for Black Shoals, which is options pricing, and that's available to anyone on Starknet on the, the testnet at the moment. Um, the second is sort of universal, right? So like what this means is, so we think about this a lot, right? It's like, you want to design for the lowest level of abstraction that you can possibly accommodate for, right? So in our land, this is token value land. There's two types of value. There's fungible ESC20 and non-fungible ESC721. And what we want to do is design a protocol that works for the entire class of ESC20s or the entire class of ESC721s, right? As opposed to building infrastructure that, you know, might only service, say like the best assets right now in ESC20 land might be ETH and Bitcoin, but that could be entirely different in two to three years. And you basically, to future-proof yourself, you want to design for the interface um, is what I think. And then the last one, which is a constant reminder to ourselves is to make things as simple as possible. So derivatives are complicated. Pricing is hard. Risk management is hard. There's a whole ton of things that can go wrong. And when you're on chain dealing with money, like when things go wrong, there's no recourse as, as we know. So minimize dependencies, right? Only inject them when you really need them. Think long and hard about things like oracles, other protocols you need to interface with and make sure you're really only doing that if it absolutely is necessary for the, for the protocol development. Um, okay, so experiment number one. So on-chain option pricing, as I said, we, <laughs> How do you price an option, right? Here's an interesting question. Um, it's not so clear, like options have a lot of different payoffs. They're based on uncertain outcomes in the future. Um, there's this model called Black-Scholes, which is this famous options pricing formula developed by two famous physicists actually, um, which kind of had, had really started the options sort of trading industry, I guess, with this pricing formula. It's now used um, quite you know, ubiquitously throughout the whole industry. Um, and it's not so important that you guys understand what the parameters are. like. Things like the spot price of the asset, the strike price of the option, how volatile the asset is, you know, how long is it till the option expires? These are all inputs, but that's not so important. Um, what's important is kind of understanding that it's a fairly complex mathematical equation and it's a great candidate for testing what you can do on StarkNet from a computational perspective, right? Um, something that most people don't bother to do on chain on Ethereum L1 is to do black shoals because it's just too mathematically difficult. Um, so what we did is we put together a grant with Starkware and we basically said, like, if you can come and implement a library for Black Shoals, then we'll, yeah, we'll give you the grant money, obviously, and, you know, we'll deploy it and, and hopefully provide a building block for people to, to build on top of. So we had some great entries and candidates, and I'll just show you guys now. Um, I'll click on, this is the winning candidate, right? So here's a repo, if anyone's kind of following along at, at home. This is a repo that I forked from the winning candidate and it's a Cairo Black Shoals library. So what I'm gonna do is just show you guys how you can actually play around with it. Um, so you might just wanna take a look here. It's a library implemented as a Cairo smart contract. Um, it's been deployed on the Gauli testnet. So we can see if we open this link here, we can actually come to Gauli and we can call the functions we need to get options prices out and things like that. That's one method of interacting with it, but I'm gonna show you guys how to pull the repo down, run the test and, and call it from the command line as well. Um, so just come back to the code, grab it, switch to my terminal, uh, I'll just clear everything out. So if we, so just for anyone following along at home, um, it's helpful to have a, I'll make this a bit bigger, have a Python um, virtual environment set up for, for um, StarkNet, right? So that you, you can basically, install the dependencies through pip and you don't have to worry about cluttering the system. Python's not great with dependencies, probably most people know. So I'm gonna clone it in here. I don't think I've got it already. Uh, there we go. If I come in here now, I should have the code now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna come back to the readme and what we're gonna do is have a look at what the steps are to, so we pulled the repo in we're gonna take a look quickly at the actual code. So I'll just show it to you on GitHub here. So as you guys can see, it's quite a mathematical library, right? So we're trying to implement things like the actual exponential function, right? Which uses a Taylor series expansion, lots of like heavy duty mathematical computation, things like that, that you wouldn't wanna do in Solidity. Um, things like logarithms as well, um, which you can use kind of approximations for. And then basically the point of all these is to be able to give us standard normal CDF as well. The point of it all is to basically be able to get, get out these functions called um, option Greeks, which are Delta, Gamma, Vega, Rho, and Theta. And basically what they do is they kind of measure the option price parameters 
can like the sensitivity of the option price to various changes in the actual input parameters. And then finally, this key one is like the option prices. So like, can we, given all the inputs, correctly price a European option on, on StarkNet? And I'll show you now how we'd actually do that. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm going to set up the test suite so we can show how it runs. I'll just go back here. Um, make sure I've got this library installed. This is a vol library, which basically lets us kind of mock option prices and see, do we have the actual same results coming out of Cairo that the Python library thinks we should have? And then I'm gonna run this PyTest here. And this is gonna now run a bunch of simulations of option prices in Python, and it's gonna test them in Cairo and see if they match. Okay, so it's gonna take a few seconds, but while we do that as well, we're going to come back and I'm going to show you how you can also call the contract as well on StarkNet via the command line. So here we've got a StarkNet call. Um, and basically what this one does is it, it's basically sending a bunch of option parameters to the StarkNet um, Black Shoals contract. Um, so time to expiry, volatility, spot price, strike price, and the interest rate as well. And it's telling us we expect to get a certain result of say $58 and 82 cents from the call option. So what we're going to do is run this parameter here. I might need to set up, yes, yeah, so I'll need to put my environment in as well. Um, I'll activate that. And then what we need to do is maybe export the network and then I should be able to run it now. And we're going to get back some results, hopefully, when we call StockNet. Here we go. So we've got back now two hexadecimal looking things. This is a call price and a put price. So what I'm gonna do now is open Python and I'm gonna say, this is base 16, give it to me back in base 10. Now we've got a big number looking ish thing. And this number, so just to give you context, is 27 digits of precision because we're trying to be precise here. So what we need to do is first take this and divide by 1 in 27. And now we're getting 58.819, which looks pretty good. That looks kind of 58.82. So we're able to successfully call the contract, um, get prices back from StarkNet, and they're looking like the prices we expect. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, I might go back to the other terminal now, and we can have a look now at some tests that we've run as well. So this version, just to give you guys context, this is uh, these, this file here, Black Shoals test. Python, and basically what it does is it just runs a number of iterations where it says, we're gonna have 10 iterations, firstly deploy the contract locally, and then generate a bunch of test data, compare it to the contract and see what we get. So if we take the first input here, so I'll try and pick one that's kind of semi-realistic. Um, okay, so let's go with zero. So this is a really long option. This is five years away, saying the volatility is 13%. Spot price is pretty similar to strike and the interest rate is pretty low. And the call price we're getting is $97.33, which is again, similar to the expected call price. So we're pretty confident that the results we're getting back from StarkNet Cairo match both the Python library and the results we expected from the GitHub readme as well. So yeah, this is just basically a, a short introduction to this experiment. I would encourage anyone listening who's interested to pull the repo down investigate the maths behind the Cairo and the functions and try and see if you can write some other tests that you know are interesting and maybe expose some functionality that's not working as expected. Um, so there's that uh, demo. Let me just check as well how long I've been going for. I'm not too long. Should I stop now? Uh, or should I, I can do one more experiment this time, but if there's not, I'll just stop. Yeah, I think one more experiment will be good. Okay, cool. So the last experiment, <laughs> so, this is cool, theoretically great and pretty useful as a building block, but it's not practically that useful, right? You can't do anything with Black Shoals except get option prices. So the team and I kind of sat down a week ago and we said like, what's something short that we can get onto StarkNet, TestNet and kind of show how we're thinking about building. Um, and it's based on this idea that kind of goes back to the, what we we're talking about at the start about we're expecting a proliferation of tokens, especially non-fungible tokens with gaming and things like that. and this question is like, how do you hedge exposure to an NFT? There's no clear way to do that. Like there's no liquid markets for derivatives on NFTs. 
And so we thought, okay, let's try and build a really simple protocol that lets a buyer and a seller of an option come together. And like, basically the, the buyer of the option is locking the NFT and receiving insurance on that option that the seller is willing to basically sell them for the option premium. So it's modeled exactly like a put option. Um, and we built together, we put together a really simple UI and UX kind of flow to show what that would look like. So I've got a video here that I can share and hopefully the quality is okay on, um, on the recording as well, because did want to show it live, but we were having a couple of flaky sort of problems with the infrastructure. So we just, we kind of just felt like it was a bit better to have a bit of control. So what we've got here, right, just to show you before we start is an interface where your NFTs come up on the left side of the screen and they're pulled in from Aspect, which is a Starknet NFT platform. So you can go into the NFT there, come to this UI when we release it publicly and your NFTs will appear there. And you can basically select one of them, right? So in this case, it might be a logo, which is not that interesting, but maybe in the future, this is like some sort of digital game item or something that's a bit more you know, valuable. Um, and you can come and select it. And then you can basically come to this form here and say, you know, I want to basically reserve the right to sell this asset for the strike price, right? So I'll show you, start to show you how it works. So I'm gonna put in strike price of say $10, $10 here. I'm willing to pay a premium of $1 and I want this option for one day. Um, and basically what we do now is we click buy put and now we're sending a transaction to the Starknet Gawley testnet and we're saying, please register this bid with the contract. Um, so it takes a few seconds as you guys probably know, we've been developing on, on Starknet um, and this, this will load, right? So basically now what we're going to get is we're creating a bid, we're kind of sending out NFT to the contract with the premium. We're saying anyone in the world can come and accept this bid and basically enter into the insurance contract with us. So now what we're doing here, just as an example, is we're kind of loading another wallet to simulate another, simulate another person who would be the option seller here. And we're showing, okay, now we see the ability to, we've seen the bid created and we can now actually come and take the other side of this trade. So what this means is we're gonna lock the strike price in the contract, in this case, $10. We're gonna receive the premium, in this case, $1. And basically what that says now is that the buyer has, at any point can come and force us to buy that asset from them. So that's basically what a put option is. So now we're selling the put here. We're gonna sign it on soon when it gets accepted. That's gonna go live. Um, we have to wait a few seconds. As you guys probably know, sometimes it's not instant. Um, and so now what we've kind of just done is we've had a buyer come create a bid, register the bid with the contract. Now the sellers come and said, I accept, I'm willing to sell you that option. I'm gonna take the premium out and it's going to be up to the buyer when we go back to their wallet to say, I want to exercise this option. I want to force you to kind of to sell you the, the NFT. So we'll get there in a sec. Um, so now we can see this option has been offered, but the acceptance hasn't clicked through yet. So just give us a sec. Um, it'll come in a sec. Now we're going back to the I, uh, the seller, sorry. Okay, so that option's now been registered. It says filled. So now this option's live. The buyer now has the ability to force this sale at any point. And we're going to show you what that looks like. And so what we're planning on doing here is building this out, making it sort of open sourceable and, and ready to be used by the public on testnet. We're not quite there yet, which is why I'm just doing a video demo, but we're hoping to be there in the next you know week or so. Um, so now we're going to exercise the put to the buyer saying, I'm going to force the sale. I'm going to receive the $10 in exchange for selling the NFT. And we will show you once that goes through, the NFT will actually be transferred to the other wallet. And so that will be the full sale from bid to acceptance and finally exercising of the option as well. We're pretty much done now. This is a little bit slower this part, but just how it works. Um, Cool, so now that's almost through. One more time back to the other wallet and we should see his NFT pop up. So let's see if we got it here. Yeah, cool, so now I just paused there. Now we've got the NFT has been transferred to the seller. So basically it's over now. Um, the UI and the UX time flow is complete. Um, yeah, so that's our second demo. Um, I'm conscious of time. We've probably been speaking for a bit too long. So 
as I said, just to wrap up, experiment one is about testing computation and building a library that people could use. This experiment's about building something practical that people can actually use. And as we go forward, we want to start to combine those things and build things that are powerful and computationally intensive, but also practical and maybe start to price ESC20 options, right? Or other things like that that are a bit more complicated. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Um, happy to call it off there and ask any, answer any questions, or I can just hand over now um, to the second speaker as well. Yep. Um, so one of the, I think that one of the principles for option pricing is, is almost built on fungibility, right? So the application for the NFTs is, is brilliant. I, yeah. I love it. Yeah. But how do you calculate the option price? Parameters? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the this, volatilities and all that. No, so this is a great question. So this concept for NFT options is just about the exchange, right? It's about don't assume anything about the pricing. So just to clarify, the, the Black Shoal stuff is to price fungible things, as you said, part, uh, something like an ETH option or a B2C option. Option pricing for NFTs is like, that's a, more of an art, not because it's like, how do you price insurance on a house or something that's non-fungible? Like it's a very bespoke thing. So what we've done for this demo is just kind of said, assume that the buyer knows the price, the right price, or just let the seller accept or not. A, a logical extension to this NFT situation would be maybe we can have some sort of request for quote system where you kind of say, I want insurance on this for, for this strike. What's the best quote you're going to give me? And then maybe an informed seller can go, okay, you know, you're selling a crypto punk. You want to sell it for 50 ETH. What's the current price? And like start to have a bit more of an informed process. But the holy grail would be like, what's an actual pricing formula for something non fungible It's almost like you can have a time series for the cohort of NFTs with similar features. Yes. Get the prices and get an index for that. 100%. So people yeah. talking about with this, like, okay, if you had a collection, what's the floor price yeah. or something like that? And could you look at, use that? But you're looking at ABM type models, like in real estate, like they built the house. Yeah. Like it's cohorts of houses with these kind of features, three bedrooms, right. really priced around this and this area, the yeah. backwards and built it, the land is like this. So yeah, the ABM kind of model that we look at. But yeah, that, that could be one way if someone wants to solve that here. Oh yeah, that would be super interesting. It's beautiful, man. Honestly, yeah. it's really nice. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. We had the the team work hard on this last few days. We we put together in like the last week or so. So the the, the concept yeah. of using yeah. the pricing for NFTs that way as in forcing somebody to sell. Well, that's what I was thinking. That's really good. I've become quite like, yeah, I've become quite into the idea of kind of forcing stuff onto the actors yeah. in the system. So the system stays simple yeah, <laughs> if possible. Because then yeah. you don't need to have the hedging aspect of the contract. Yes, it's, it's all assumed that the seller has to yeah. deal with their stuff. Whereas at Lyra at the moment on Avalon, we have to hedge everyone, think for everyone, yeah. go to spot markets. Yeah. There's a lot of risk. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is the complete other approach yeah. and simpler to build. Um, cool. Any other questions from anyone here or anyone on, online as well? Yeah, so when yeah. you um, yeah. like sell a put, mm. you need to lock up your nft right uh sorry when you buy the put you lock up the nft because your so your nft goes for the contract in case it's basically so obviously if you didn't send it there you could just send it somewhere else um so you buy the nft you send your nft and then the seller comes and says okay i'm willing to lock my strike price collateral in there to take the free money. basically yeah yeah it seems like a huge ux barrier like if you can't use your nft then like why, why would you want to? Um, well, I'm, I mean, you could imagine, say again, you had a punk or an ape and you said, I'm not planning on selling this, but if the floor crashes to one ETH for some reason, something gets found out about punks or something, like I want to have protection against that downside. Um, yeah. But but like because you lock it up, you don't actually own it. So you don't get any of the utility. But as soon as the, con the, the as soon as the option expires, you get the NFT back. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like you could have the option for a week, and then if it expires and you choose not to exercise it, then you just get the NFT back from the contract. So we're generating yeah. yields off an NFT that we're not really using. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how that fits into things like surprise airdrop, like you know, oh no, my NFT is locked on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's a good point. Exactly. You do lose some of the yeah. Well, you'd lose that benefit for sure. Um, so yeah, lots to work on, but good first steps, I think, into the ecosystem and kind of seeing what's possible. Um, cool, I think maybe we should stop talking because I feel like we've been going for too long, but thanks for giving us the ability to go a bit longer, appreciate it. Um, can hand over now to, back to topology, guys. I'll just stop sharing. Uh, uh, thank you, Mike. Um, 
Marcelo, you can start. And we'll have okay, a QA. Sure. So, so anyone can ask questions. Okay. Yeah. So, first of all, Mike, thank you for a lot of context. Uh, we have a bit of that to work on. Uh, let me just find the proper tab I want to share. Um, sorry, it's a mess. I have like thousands of them open. So, just a second. Uh, can you see my screen? Wait. Can you see it? Perfect. Uh, yeah, I can say it. Yeah, we can get we got it here. Okay, amazing. So I'm going to talk about fossils. So fossil is a fantastic tool you can use to build derivatives on top. Um, so maybe now that we have a bit of context, we use the term volatility many, many, many times. Um, so how we get volatility nowadays on on ribbon or wherever? Uh, well, usually we have a we have an oracle. Which is not that great because we just use chaining and we offload the entire computation uh, of the chain. But with uh, with fossil and very cheap computation and call data on on L2s, we can do the entire calculation on on chain. And fossil is one of these tools that allows us to to do that. So maybe I will show you the agenda first. And actually, I have twenty minutes. I hope I will manage to uh, explain all these things. So what is fossil? Uh, what problem does it solve? Uh, we're going to have a little case study. Uh, I'm going to talk about Ethereum trice, then about trees, but probably not necessarily. I'm going to explain the difference between a Miracle tree and a Miracle Patricia tree, but I guess we can skip that part um, because we might run out, run out of time. Uh, then the Ethereum storage uh, layout. So, um, yeah, and then this trade off between computation and, and storage and how Fossil fits into that. And obviously, new application designs that are unlocked by, by Fossil. Okay, amazing. So, uh, what's the biggest problem on L1, at least for me right now, is that uh, our applications, our contracts do not have access to historical state. And also, reading the current state is quite expensive. And that ability like locks. Uh, a huge amount of like application design. And this is very important for derivatives because in case of derivatives, we want to look in the past usually. And well, with the current EVM construction, we cannot really do that, right? So that re for that reason, we are using like chaining and, and, and stuff. Uh, there are also some other approaches I'll talk about them later. And then obviously now talking about Starknet, Starknet does not have access to, to Ethereum. So we cannot really read uh, a Uniswap V2 price from one week ago or even the current one. But Fossil is here to fix it. So as you see on the graphic, I have uh, two chains and like nowadays, these are two separate separate words not able to talk with each other and read one, one read, the, read the other. We can all use messages, but obviously messages are not guaranteed to be processed by the sequencer. Um, so sending a huge amount of them is probably not the best idea. I mean, I if we can avoid it, then that would be great. Uh, and obviously, on one computation is expensive because Fossil uses a trick to read the historical state. Um, so we can, if we have access to the state route, then against the state route, we can prove any any past state, right? But this is extremely expensive in terms of computation because it requires a repeat coding, it requires uh, verifying proofs, it requires uh, running Ketchak. So it's not something we want to do on a one, definitely. Um, however, with Fossil and cheap computation, uh, we can do that. Okay, so let's start with a case study to like, give you a bit of context. Imagine that we want to settle a derivative uh, based on the base fee monthly average, right? So we have three approaches to do that. How will we get the monthly average? So we can use Chainlink and simply compute it off chain and, and have a trusted oracle. Uh, we can have a Is that us or is that much I, I simply poke like... the contract. Oh, you're back. Um, okay, I'm back. Um, where did they stop? Can you still see my screen? Yeah, um, I think you can perhaps start over with the slide. That would be great. Okay, so. Yeah, I wanted to present a case study, so uh, I will keep it uh, keep it fast. So let's imagine we want to settle a derivative based on the base fee monthly average. Um, so we have three approaches to get this, this average. Uh, so we can use Chainlink, right? Um, but then the computation happens fully fully off chain, uh, and there is a huge trust assumption. Um, so it's not the best solution. I mean, 
in some cases we want to avoid it then uh, another approach you can simply have a cron that will poke a, a contract and save something to the state let's say every one one minute and obviously what happens during the the, the entire minute uh, this data gets lost so this is also there is also a trade-off and obviously it's super costly because we're saving to the state every minute for 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 a month so uh well it's on chain it's, it's secure but it's very very expensive um then what we can do uh, the last approach we can just keep submitting block headers and verifying that these block headers actually existed on, on the one, but here there is no problem. So the EVM has access to the last 256 historical block hashes. So um, yeah, we can essentially validate the block headers against the last 256 or from the block header, we can decode the parent hash. And then if we reach this 200, 56 we can just decode and so on and so on but it sounds like a lot of cold data so it's gonna be expensive anyways so um we don't have really have a good solution here and however with uh, on a tool with cheap computation and cheap cold data uh, this becomes feasible and I'm, i'll explain it later um okay so how does it work so i'm gonna talk first about the ethereum block headers because like i said or i didn't uh fossil essentially allows us to read the current and historical Ethereum state on StarkNet without compromising any security. And Fossil is not an Oracle um, because it uses the same techniques as a light client. Um, and a part of the state, we can also read the transactions, the, all the parameters from a block header. We can read uh, historical logs, pretty much everything that is committed uh, in some way to, to a block header. So uh, we can read the parent hash, we can read the block counts, we can read the timestamp and all these parameters that you see. So I will talk about actually four parameters from the block header. So parent hash, so this is crucial. Um, also one very important thing, uh, an Ethereum block hash is just the hash of the of the header, and this is super important. And then we so what does it mean? If we set one time, but how do we get the, the initial hash? Well, in that case, we need to send a message from a one. So yes, there is some reason the sequence sequence they want to pick up the message. Um, but still, it's only one message, so it's auditable. Everyone can verify it. And then uh, with that single message, you can essentially create entire history from the block we submitted to, to Genesis. OK, so with the parent hash, we can decode it and then save it. So we can keep submitting block headers and repeat that process to, to the Genesis block. So this is how we like travel from the current state to, to the past state. But now, how do we access that state? Uh, well, we have the state root. Uh, we have the transaction root and the receipt root. And all these roots are the roots of a uh, Merkle Patricia tree. And against these roots, we can simply generate uh, generate proofs, right? Uh, using some dedicated RPC methods. Um, so for the state root, it's uh, quite simple. It, I think it's just ETH get proof. And essentially, a state proof and the state tries is like two level structure. So first, we have the, the the tree of accounts, and then every account has a tree of uh, of storage slots. Obviously, if it's a smart contract, for the transactions root, well, it's just a tree of transactions, and for the receipts, it's just a tree of of receipts. So it's quite simple. So this is um, this is the technique that we are kind of leveraging to access this this historical data. Um, okay, and obviously, we can also access the 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 fossil um, okay cool number n then with n plus one holding in the past so um so yeah you can simply use this, this technique and travel in the past and then like i said uh, every account on here has an ounce a balance a code hash and a storage root uh, can you still hear me i'm very sorry but my connection is very unstable today um hey, you know cut out for a bit okay where did i stop Uh, I think it was a, a bit choppy for the last few seconds. But we're good now. Okay, we're good. Um, okay, so like I said, uh, an account on Ethereum contains a nonce, a balance, a code hash, and the storage root. So 
now with the data, what we can do. So we can access the nonce, we can access the balance, the Ethereum, the, the balance is just the if, if balance, then the code hash, the, the code hash is not empty if it's a smart contract, and same for the storage, because EOAs only have a nonce and a balance, that's it. Um, obviously, these this, this fields are also in, in the tree, however, this, these are empty hashes, so we don't really care. So now the question is, how do we, for example, read my die balance from two weeks ago? So first of all, with Fossil, I need to prove that such an account exists on Ethereum, and then once this account is proven for that specific block, I can prove any claims against the storage route. And I will get to that later, how we go from all these trees to an actual balance in the past. So uh, this is how we how, how it works. So first of all, we need to verify headers and validate headers and like keep walking through the past. And then once we reach the point where we want to prove something or access some data, uh, we simply verify state proofs or transaction proofs. OK, uh, like I said, uh, I will skip Merkle trees because we have only nine minutes. And I guess you will have some questions. Okay, so Ethereum storage layout. Uh, this is very important. Uh, I was talking about Merkle, uh, Merkle Patricia trees and uh, and how an account is structured on Ethereum. So, well, like I said, the the, sto the storage hash of an account is just the root of the of the Merkle Patricia trees of all the storage slots. And now, how do we go from let's say balance off of zero uh, x beef? To, to an actual storage uh, storage slot. So this is quite simple. As you see, the first, or I should say the second variable defined as this contract is balance of. So what we need to do, we need to take the catch up of the address and the slot and the, the storage, the slot index in that case is one. We concatenate them together, we catch up them, and that, that way we have this the, the storage slot. So now with the storage slot, we can actually generate proofs for the specific storage slot and then verify them with fossil on, on Starknet. So um, yeah, this is how we actually access uh, state of Starknet using fossil. We don't really access it, but we need to generate proofs. But like I said, um, everything is verified, so there is no compromise on security. Um, okay, so to recap, I think that we don't need to recap. Um, maybe just a waste of time. So, like I said, verifying proof is costly, at least on L1, but on Starknet, because we have cheap computation and extremely cheap call data, because Fossil, well, requires lots of call data, right? Because we need to submit block headers and we need to submit uh, proofs. So this is a lot of data. However, call data is not committed, does not release a uh, long footprint when Starknet operates, so it's, it's extremely cheap. And what we care about is computation, which is also cheap. Uh, um, for now, the biggest overhead for, for Fossil is on, on Starknet, and Kachak is extremely Starknet friendly. So uh, this is the, the biggest cost so far. However, this is getting improved over and over uh, over time. So yeah, this is how Fossil works. And now I'm going to talk about new application design. So like I said, whenever we create a smart contract or an application or one, we usually think about like the current state, right? We have we can have like a Uniswap v2 pool. We don't really care what was in the past, right? But with Fossil and Starknet, now we can change this a little bit. And also uh, this technique that is used by Fossil is also applicable for Starknet. So we can use this technique to like access historical Starknet state on Starknet. And this is gonna be extremely cheap because uh, Starknet uses Peterson and Peterson is Stark friendly. So um, yeah, this, this unlocks a huge, huge amount of new application designs. And this is, I think, very, I hope that the derivatives will be the first place to, to, to apply that, because like, like we said, very often we need the volatility and to calculate the volatility of, let's say, ETH USD using Fossil, we can simply read every single ETH USD on Uniswap V2 and take the monthly volatility of that. And that way we don't need, we don't need to use chain link and, and stuff. Um, we can also create TWAPs to, to settle those derivatives because uh, now the reason why uh, Chainlink is also used for, for settlements is because very often we need a TWAP, right? Because we cannot look at the current spot, right? Because then the cost of, of manipulation is, is pretty low. But, and again, we, we are relying on Chainlink, uh, which is not as good as a, as a fully trusted solution uh, uh, like, uh, like Fossil. So, so yeah, I think that's pretty much it. 
This is the architecture overview. Let me check how much time we have. We have five minutes left, so I will quickly go for it. So what happens on L1? Fossil is a set of contracts on L1 and L2. The L1 is Ethereum and the L2 is uh, is Darknet. Also, the L1 can be optimized polygon arbitrary because uh, all these chains are EVM compatible, so the, the structure of the tree is almost the same. If we are able to send a block hash of polygon arbitrum or, or optimism to start with, then we can also access the state of the of these chains. Um, but let's focus on, on Ethereum. So what do we do? We call the on L1, we call the opcode block hash. Then we send it as a message to, to L2. Once this message is received, we save it to a so-called Ethereum's block header store. And then with that hash, we can submit a header and hash this header and check against this hash and decode the parent hash, save it, and, and that's it. We have block X processed. And then against this, this block, we can retrieve the state route, the transaction route, or the receipt route. And against all these routes, we can generate proofs. That's pretty simple. And obviously, um, the verifying proof is a bit costly, especially if we want to prove claims against DAI. And I guess many users might want to prove claims against DAI. That's a specific block. Let's take uh, applications like Snapshot, right? Um, and they want to check that a specific user had enough voting power at this specific point in time, right? So there is no need to verify an account every time a user wants to prove that it has a balance, but we verify this account once, and then we just verify specific storage slots. And for that reason, we also have a so-called fax registry, which acts like a cache. But anyways, this is just a, just a small optimization. So this is how Fossil works, more or less. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions and you'd like, uh, maybe a more technical workshop then just reach out to me this is the the github you can check it out you can play with the tests um and yeah that's it um we have three minutes left so i'm waiting for questions then we've got a question on our end um hey uh marcelo it's uh me res from mutable i think we talked about the nft bridge a couple oh. weeks back. Mm -hmm. yeah I yeah was yeah, I was just thinking about like the solution now a bit more and the reliance on storage slots and how it's kind of not really standards aware. So I think a problem I see for like general bridges yep. using this solution is that different contracts will use different storage slots for things like, you know, the owner parameter or something which you might want to verify. So I'm curious in your mind, do you uh, think that's a problem? Um, yes, the standardization is a bit problematic, but like I said, on, on Ethereum, every account has a code hash. So essentially, we can prove that the specific smart contract has a, has a code hash, and then we can, for example, see if a specific standard is implemented, or at least we can see if, it, if this contract is, is, is using a proxy or something like that. But yes, I agree. However, I think that this is not such a big problem as we, as we think it is. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, any more questions? We got one more. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, the main purpose of Fossil is you can access um, data from L1 or any L2, right? But uh, when you do okay. it, well, is it actually gas free or um, what's uh, what's the cost involved in it? So the only cost is obviously on L2, uh, which is in Cairo steps. Right now, verifying a single proof, uh, Merkel Patricia proof costs around 350 Cairo steps. But like I said, the biggest overhead is Ketchak. And Ketchak is going to be a built-in soon. And the improvement is going to be like 10 times. So obviously, Fossil will be also 10 times cheaper. And this cost will keep going down because of future improvements in the in the Cairo VM, because nowadays uh, Kachak is <laughs> is executed fully in, in the VM itself, which is which is pretty, pretty, pretty expensive. But soon it will be a built-in, similarly to also uh, EC, EC operations.
Okay, I think it seems like there are no questions. So should we wrap it up? Yeah, that would be great. Uh, any, any more questions from the audience? Well, I guess we can wrap it up here then. Um, thank you again, Marcello, and thank you, Mike. Um, that, uh, that, that concludes our Starkness session today. Again, uh, any more questions, please ask right now. And of course, uh, you can follow up with the speakers today on our Discord, and you can also, uh, I'm sure you can DM them on Twitter. They'll, they'll be reading your messages, so. Cool, thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. Cool. See ya, bye-bye. Cool, take care, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.